In 1985, the landscape of New York City, I envisioned it as uh, the same as Vietnam, that there were bodies literally everywhere. You couldn't tell the difference in those days between people sleeping and the bags of garbage. And I thought, how could this happen in the richest country, in the richest city uh, in the world? New York City in the late 80s and early 90s for me was a crack-infested place. I was like part of the problem because I was selling drugs. The late 80s in New York City was a hellhole. A lot of people were in the shelters. George and I learned about homelessness in a very different way than just seeing people on the street. We knew the homeless as individual human beings. And when you actually know people, it's a completely different experience. I went to Grand Central in 1984. As I was feeding the people, I got to know them, and I did it for, for 700 nights in a row, two years. And I listened to what the people said. And over and over again, I heard, George, appreciate the sandwich, but what I'm really looking for is a room and a job a room and a job to pay for it. The underlying issue was poverty and lack of opportunity. So it made sense to me that we should try to put together some kind of a program that helped people help themselves. So we put together the Ready, Willing, and Able program. Uh, the first day of David Dingen's administration, we went out to work. We were an overwhelming success uh, overnight. We worked in the absolute poorest neighborhoods of New York, so we thought, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna buy the guys' uniforms with our last money before we went bankrupt, and put them out, and we're gonna have them clean the streets. In our experience, the, the lack of economic opportunity is at the root of all of the problems that we face, like the homeless system, is really a lack of opportunity, and we, provide an opportunity for people to help themselves go to work, and then go on and climb the economic ladder themselves. My name is Nazarian Griffin, and I'm currently the program director at the Harlem Center for Opportunity. If I hadn't come to the Doe Fund, I'd probably be dead. I used to sell drugs. I was a crook, a thief, a um, robber. Um, you name it, I did it. I ate, slept and breathe crack. My world evolved around that drug. It got us low that I was willing to take a life for a thousand dollars and all the crack I could carry. I had become part of the less, the hopeless, the helpless, the jobless, the hapless. Anything that was, I was less. But I had gotten acceptance that I was going to die a horrific death in, a, in an abandoned building. And that was OK. I thought that would be the best thing for everybody. My suffering would end. I would no longer be a parasite tugging away at society. And my mother could stop worrying about me. I was on drugs for 17 years. I didn't have no direction. I didn't have no guidance. I was 19 going on 20 when I went to prison. For 32 years, I was incarcerated in New York State Corrections. I was like in a cage, watching the world turn as I sat dormant. In the last couple of years, the number of young people who come to our doors has doubled. When you've been deprived of opportunity your entire life, there is only two places where you can go prison or homelessness on the street. I had to spend 13 or 14 months on Rikers Island because I could not afford a $1,500 bail. When I was 15, my mother, who is an alcoholic prostitute, threw me out the house. First became homeless when I was 17 due to my father being incarcerated. I was 15 years old and my family, me and my family, we had to move to a shelter. I made money by selling drugs. I couldn't read, couldn't write. I felt like that's the only thing I could do to take care of me and my family. We have a unique opportunity 
with our young men to prevent them from lives of absolute misery. What disconnected people in our society have, people who are homeless, who are long-term unemployed, who are formerly incarcerated, is that they lack an opportunity, this, that nobody treats them for the human capital that they are. And we as a society don't give them the hand up that they need. When people come here, they really profoundly change because they're earning money, they're busy working like everybody else. They get amazing feeling of self-importance and value and worth and you see a future, you see hope. While I was selling drugs, I was really helping destroy the community. And it just felt good pushing a bucket and I'm participating and help clean it up. When you're pushing that bucket, it's just you and the bucket. And so there's a, there's a process that happens. It takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of acceptance of where you are in your life. The fact that you're doing that allows you the, the, the vehicle to to, to accept your, where you are at right now in your life. Pushing the bucket was so important because in reality, while I was out there, I was pushing the bucket, I was able to think about the things I wanted to do, what I really wanted to be involved with. And at the same time, I was doing a good job because I took pride in what I was doing. It's a job, it, it's, it's, it's more than a job, it's just a responsibility, you have a responsibility. It's not just picking up trash. Um, a lot of people may see it that way, it, it's, it's something more. Uh, the first thing I thought when I heard about the Doe Fund was finally an opportunity that I can use, kind of a light in the tunnel. Before the Doe Fund, I didn't really have an opportunity to stay out of trouble. Now I see life clearer. What the Doe Fund offered was opportunity. That's all that I needed to start changing my life. The Doe Fund has given me a new lease on life. It lit the a light that had all but gone out in me. I never thought I would have another chance. The Dole Fund is completely different from a lot of facilities and being in foster care. I never really received that type of help. They had so many resources, pest arrest, the exterminator course, maintenance course with the OSHA, um, the culinary arts with the surf saver, the food handlers, you know, the CDL classes. It's just with so many things that they had to offer, you know, to allow you to get back on your feet. The skills I learned at the Doe Fund were uh, firstly how to interview, I sharpened my interviewing skills. Then I learned more about uh, back office and computers, how to work at a desk. And then they really taught me how to network, you know, how to work outside the Doe Fund. Currently I work as a supervisor for Amazon Prime. When I came through the Doe Fund, my reading level was at a fourth grade reading level and my math was at a third grade. Since then I accomplished my GED. My relationship with my kids has been great. They proud of me, don't have no worries about me going back to prison or nothing like that. They know that they have a father that's gonna be there for them for now. So for 30 years, we've been providing an economic opportunity for folks that need it the most, and we're gonna keep on providing it every day until everyone has that opportunity themselves.